This um, is, is kind of an interesting, I've, I've really never given this lecture before, and um, well, one time I gave sort of this lecture, I was asked uh, by a friend of mine uh, who was from Spain to talk about the retroperitoneal spaces. He had come and visited at NYU and we had looked at a few cases. So I thought it was an interesting topic because it's something that we don't really think about. It's different from your typical pancreas or your bowel thing. So let's see what we can kind of learn about diseases from considering the retroperitoneal spaces. <clears throat> so first, um, some anatomic considerations. The retroperitoneum is divided into three spaces. Surgically, when the surgeons operate, it's, it's, it's essentially they, they realize the same thing. Uh, let me just go over some of these uh, spaces with you. First of all, there are three spaces, the anterior pararenal space, the perirenal space, and the posterior pararenal space. Now, if you have a, a CT examination or an MR examination and there is no pathology, it's very difficult to discern the fascial planes that separate these spaces. If we look at uh, the image on your <coughs> right, you notice that there is some pathology occurring in this patient. In fact, this patient has pancreatitis and there's some stranding of the fat in the anterior pararenal space. But you'll notice in this case that the anterior perirenal fascia, which is this fascia right here, otherwise known as gerotis fascia, is thickened. This is actually two leaves of fascia that are fused together. And in the setting of pathology, some fluid and edema will accumulate in that space and therefore we're allowed to see it. This is the anterior perirenal uh, fascia and the posterior perirenal fascia is along this line right here. These two fascial planes fuse essentially to form what's known as the lateral conal fascia. Okay, C-O-N-A-L, lateral conal fascia. And this fascia continues up as the properitoneal fascia of the peritoneal cavity. Now, interestingly, in this case, you cannot see the posterior parietal peritoneum. The posterior parietal peritoneum is going to be right in this area. Remember, it, it kind of covers the ventral aspect of the left colon and the right colon on the other side. But it's almost impossible to see that particular fascia, that, that plane. The posterior parietal peritoneum, which is here, is the ventral aspect of the anterior pararenal space. The posterior aspect of the anterior pararenal space is the anterior pararenal fascia. The ventral aspect of the anterior, oh, excuse me, of the perirenal space is this anterior perirenal fascia. And of course, the posterior and lateral aspects of the perirenal space is the posterior perirenal fascia. So anatomically, that's what we are looking at. And it really defines the three spaces. That is the anterior perirenal space, which contains the colon, the pancreas and the second and third portions of the duodenum and the fourth portion, the perirenal space, which contains the kidney, the adrenal gland, obviously these vessels, and then there's a posterior perirenal space, which is really just some fat, and obviously pathology such as hemorrhage and lymphoma, metastatic disease, and, and neurogenic tumors can sometimes uh, be visualized in that space. The aorta and the inferior vena cava are kind of in their own separate space. They really don't belong in either of these two spaces, but are important in the sense that diseases from one to the other can track up along the mesenteric vessels that lead out of the uh, retroperitoneum and into the um, peritoneal cavity. Of course, we have the posterior parietal peritoneum, which we don't see, and very much interdigitates and is not a very smooth line, because you'll notice these loops of jejunum are obviously intraperitoneal structures. Yet the colon, this being the descending colon, is a retroperitoneal structure. So we realize that there is a, you know, undulating fascial plane of the anterior, excuse me, posterior parietal peritoneum. What's very interesting, I think, from time to time, and if you look at these spaces, uh, you know, what you, I want you to consider is their extent in the transverse plane the AP plane, and of course, the cranial caudal plane. And we'll see examples of this in, entirely as we go through here. Here's a patient with rather severe pancreatitis, right? When we do a CT for pancreatitis, we want to evaluate for necrosis, and there's about 30% necrosis in this gland. And there's a lot of edema and peripancreatic fat necrosis. And again, in this case, you can see the demarcation of those retroperitoneal spaces. Here is the anterior perirenal fascia, that is gerotis fascia, the posterior perirenal fascia, and then again the lateral conal fascia. So all of this 
inflammatory process that we see here is in the anterior pararenal space. Interestingly, in this patient and in the vast majority of patients, the perirenal fascia is protective in that disease processes that occur in the anterior perirenal space tend not to cross over into the perirenal space, and similarly, processes in the perirenal space tend not to gain access into the anterior perirenal space. There are obviously exceptions, and I'll show you those, but visualization of thickening of these perirenal fascial planes tells you that there is disease occurring, and where the majority of the inflammatory process is seen is going to lead you to which organ is likely involved. Another patient who has actually severe pancreatitis, this is in necrosis of the entire gland, all right? Even in the setting of almost 100% necrosis in the gland, you have thickening of that anterior perirenal fascia, fluid and debris is leaking in between the leaves of the posterior perirenal fascia right here, and you can see some fluid around the colon. All of this is in the anterior perirenal space. The perirenal space, again, which contains the kidneys and the adrenals, is preserved. This person, if you look during the pancreatic phase and during the venous phase, the delayed phase, the enhancement of this gland continues to be 50 Hounsfield units. There is absolutely no enhancement. This is severe pancreatitis, and just to remind you that pancreatitis can be a lethal disease, and this patient died later that evening. It's from uh, the complications of severe pancreatitis. There's actually a very small amount of enhancing pancreatic parenchyma in the unsynap process, but even in such severe disease, the perirenal space is protected. Another person who has, you know, 40% of the pancreatic tail necrotic, just a chunk taken out, a big, you know, 10% of the gland in the region of the neck gone, necrotic. You see all this fluid leaking out into the peritoneal cavity. If we look a little bit lower, though, in this patient, you can see that this stuff tracks, and that anterior perirenal space is really continuous from the diaphragms all the way into the pelvis. And it explains a lot of uh, pathology that we'll get to in just a moment after we review these anatomic considerations. But notice all this fluid in the anterior perirenal space distending the posterior perirenal fascia, again, this being the lateral conal fascia, the perirenal space itself and the perirenal fat being well preserved. Interestingly, in this patient, though, I'll just show you the, the follow-up, and it's always nice to get follow-up, and it's one of the reasons why I really love working where, where I do, because I always get to see what happens to these patients. This was uh, July 16th. You see that all that necrosis. Well, she had no evidence of infection, and the question always is, when do you operate on necrosis? Well, really, only if it's infected. You know, and the patient had no signs of infection. She was treated conservatively. A couple of months later, you can see this thing is kind of coalescing into a well-formed pseudocyst, which surprisingly is almost entirely gone on the last CT that she's had. It's only about two centimeters. So she did extremely well. Now, another patient, when you see these fascial planes, again, the anterior perirenal fascia, the posterior perirenal fascia, gerotus fascia, we have thickening of these planes, something is going on, all right? And if we look very carefully, this pathology is in the anterior perirenal space. In general, that's telling you that it's not a kidney process, but it's likely going to be coming from the pancreas, the duodenum, or the colon. And in this person, well, the colon has collapsed. It's hard to make a, an assessment of it, but you'll notice that there's one, two, three, four abnormal lymph nodes adjacent to that descending colon and visualization of lymphadenopathy adjacent to a piece of colon is a very strong uh, suggestion that there's a colonic neoplasm there. On the basis of this, the patient had a colonoscopy which confirmed an adenocarcinoma in the mid-descending colon, and this is metastatic lymphadenopathy. And it's probably the, the lymph nodes that are causing lymphedema around this colon and allowing us to visualize those uh, fascial planes. Another patient who clearly has colonic pathology, and a little bit unusual in that the colon is circumferentially thickened. Usually it's more uh, asymmetric in the setting of diverticulitis, but this is a patient who has diverticulitis. Here's the inflamed diverticulum. Again, showing that the process, the inflammation that we see is in the anterior perirenal space. Again, the lateral conal fascia well visualized, the posterior perirenal and the anterior perirenal fascia. And in this patient, again, the perirenal space is pretty clean. And what about this person? Again, we nicely see that there is thickening and fluid in the anterior perirenal fascia, lateral conal fascia, and posterior perirenal fascia. 
But in this person, if we look, you know, where is the pathology? Well, most of the edema in fluid that we see is actually in the perirenal space, not in the anterior perirenal space on both of these images. And in fact, if you look very carefully, uh, this scan was done at about 75, 80 seconds. We have a nice nephrogram on the right, and it's a cortical medullary phase over here. So there's a delay in the nephrogram. When you see a delay in the nephrogram like this, it's really due to one of three things. That's an arterial inflow problem, a venous outflow problem, or most commonly, obstructive uropathy from a stone, and this patient had a small stone in the distal left ureter. But again, just showing you how you can use these anatomic considerations to help clue you in on what's going on. Now, does pathology on one side cross over to the other? Well, there was some uh, very nice experiments by Mort Myers uh, on cadavers where they injected iodinated contrast into one perirenal space at like two or three cc's per second, 100 mLs of the stuff, and they found that in fact you can, in a certain amount of patients, it will cross over to the contralateral side. Whether that is a true anatomic uh, process or it was occurring in a dead person and you're using a power injector to inject contrast, who knows? But the truth is, is that if you look at cases, and this is a patient who sustained blunt abdominal trauma, you can see that this entire kidney is, is lacerated and, and well, the vast majority of it devascularized with a huge retroperitoneal hematoma predominantly in that perirenal space, but it is, in fact, crossing over to the contralateral side, a small amount of it. So a pathologic process can go from one side to the other in the perirenal space. Clearly, in the anterior perirenal space, this space is entirely free across the retroperitoneum. Here's another interesting case from just the other day. It was a person who had uh, lower pelvic pain and was the CT scan was ordered with IV contrast. It infiltrated, and about only a small amount of contrast was administered. Ten minutes later, the scan was done. They couldn't get an IV in the patient. You'll notice a little bit of contrast in the collecting system. But as we scroll through this patient, again, here's the contrast. Notice that the contrast is leaking out of the collecting system into that perirenal fascial plane from one side to the other. And the question is, why is this happening in this person? Um, again, we have calyectasis. And in fact, the ureters are dilated. Again, you can see that fluid crossing over the midline there. Well, what happened was this person has a huge distended urinary bladder. In fact, her Foley catheter was stuck in her urethra and wasn't, wasn't properly functioning. So in this patient, obstructive uropathy from bladder outlet obstruction, the calyces and fornices of the kidneys blew up, and that contrast leaked into the perirenal space and then across from one side to the other. Now, this is an interesting example because while I focused in on how these fascial planes protect one side from the other, uh, this is an interesting case, a woman with a rather large, bulky cervical carcinoma on the CT examination. And in fact, she had obstruction of the left ureter as a result of that cervical carcinoma. So we see that there's some hydronephrosis and dilatation, but there's also this collection of fluid which is, shows a rather thick wall around it. And if we follow this down, notice this communicates right through that anterior perirenal fascia. Let me just come back up through that. And this is a person who, for whatever reason, has an anatomic defect in that fascial plane. It's not uh, that surprising that anatomic variants occur. We see them all the time with, with everything. And so not in every patient are these anatomic borders uh, intact. And this fluid tracked all the way down to the pelvis. Now, interestingly, she was treated with radiation. The cervical carcinoma uh, resolved or, or shrunk down quite a bit. There's still very minimal fullness, but that collection that was up here has now resolved because the hydronephrosis has resolved, allowed that urine to drain out. Now, this is another interesting case, just looking at anatomic variants. A patient who comes in with pancreatitis, on the CT, we see a lot of edema and stranding fluid, predominantly in the anterior perirenal space. The perirenal space is well-preserved. Two days later, we did an MR looking for uh, stones in the biliary tree. There were none. But notice in this patient now that there is very little fluid in the anterior perirenal space. In fact, it's now all surrounding the kidneys in the perirenal space. And again, this is the CT, and then two days later, the MR. And this is another person who has somewhat porous uh, space of that anterior perirenal fascia, allowing fluid to evidently just drain through from one side to the other. And I don't think that this is an effect that MR is more, uh, has higher contrast than the CT because we can clearly see the fluid around the pancreas on the CT. It's just in a different place, and there must be some defect in those uh, renal, uh, perirenal fascial planes. As I had mentioned, I got this 
a slide from uh, uh, an article on the retroperitoneal spaces, but you know, the exact anatomy is not 100% clear, but it does appear to be that there's communication of the perirenal space on the right all the way to the bare area of the diaphragm. These spaces are clearly continuous down into the pelvis, there's no question. The anterior perirenal space on the right side gets trapped by the liver, but on the left side can go all the way up to the diaphragm. So let's look at another case. This is a, a person who came to Bellevue Hospital after sustaining, a, was hit by a car. And <clears throat> we did a trauma CT. This is a slightly delayed scan, which again shows that there is devascularization, large contusion uh, in the right kidney, and obviously there's active extravasation of contrast, it's a slightly delayed image, from that right kidney. Now if we look at this patient, interestingly, this contrast is coming up in, into the subhepatic space, and in fact, if you look carefully, it's tracking along the right side of the liver, so this contrast is somehow in the peritoneal cavity. The kidney, as we know, is two layers deep in the retroperitoneum, in the, perine in the perirenal space. So, you know, I wasn't really thinking in this case, but I'm going to show you this case because I think it's an important case. Does anybody know what else is happening to this guy? Blunt trauma. It's some, a diagnosis that I think that we as radiologists frequently do not make, but we really need to consider, and I think with the use of multi-detector scanners and workstations, it would be much easier to make this diagnosis. Well, I'll come back to it in a second, but this is the, the examination at the same time as a large uh, uh, hemothorax on the right side. Well, the patient was treated conservatively. They put in a chest tube to drain the hemothorax, and then a day or two later, urine started draining out of the chest tube. And so they repeated the CT scan, and you'll notice that the right colon is now herniated up into the diaphragm. And if I just come back, this is the right cruise of the diaphragm, piece of the right cruise here is entirely lifted off of the spine. And this patient has a diaphragmatic defect. The patient was then taken to the operating room. This is kind of a sagittal view. This is the collapsed lung, the diaphragm, the big hole in the back of the diaphragm allowing the urine that was leaking out of that kidney to come up into the pleural space. And so these spaces are contiguous with the diaphragm. The point of this case is to demonstrate that, but also to make you aware when you're looking at these blunt trauma cases to consider the possibility of now, this is a case that's already four or five years old, but you know, with multi-detector scanners, you really should be, I think, looking, you know, whenever there's significant blunt trauma at the diaphragms, looking for defects to see if, in fact, there is a diaphragmatic hernia, because if, it, if there is, it really should be repaired. Little bowel can get incarcerated in that, become strangulated and infarct. The cranial caudal extent of these retroperitoneal spaces, I think, is uh, sometimes nicely uh, displayed after iatrogenic injuries. This is a patient who had underwent an ERCP, a traumatic ERCP, in that they perforated the duodenum. We did a CT scan. The patient received positive contrast. You can see contrast leaking from the duodenum into the perirenal, uh, excuse me, into the anterior perirenal space and along that anterior perirenal fascia. It kind of surrounds the perirenal space coming into the posterior perirenal space. <clears throat> and this patient, if we follow this contrast caudally, you'll notice that it continues all the way down into the pelvis, in fact, on the right side, and then goes up on the left side. I mean, it's really amazing sometimes if you think of how these spaces communicate, how blood or pathologic process or infection in one area that starts up at the kidney can seed all the way down into the pelvis, and this is the reason why it's able, because this is an anatomic uh, space. Regarding the left side, another patient with rather severe pancreatitis, you can see there's a little bit of necrosis, a large fluid collection in the lesser sac, and you can see the fluid and edema tracking along those posterior perirenal fascia up around the kidney, continues down into the left flank and into the uh, lateral conal fascia and the fascia along the, the left wall. Again, in this patient, you'll notice how the perirenal fat is well preserved, despite the severe pancreatitis. If we look at coronal images, you'll notice that this is the anterior perirenal space. This fluid and debris tracks all the way up to the diaphragm. And this explains why patients who have severe pancreatitis can get mediastinal pseudocyst because those fluid collections and debris can track right up out the hiatus of the esophagus. Another thing that if you look very carefully in these uh, coronal reformatted images, the right subcutaneous tissues look pretty normal. The left subcutaneous tissues show edema and stranding. And pathologic processes can actually extend from the retroperitoneum out through anatomic points of weakness, usually around the insertions of the flank muscles and on the anterior iliac 
uh, crest, and you can clinically visualize this as a Gray Turner sign, right? This is not the same patient, but this is what our patient did look like, presented with discoloration of the skin because of that blood in, that's tracked out into that space. Of course, it can go all the way around to anterior abdomen along the umbilicus, so-called Cullen sign. So not only are these spaces continuous in the retroperitoneum, but can actually extend out into the subcutaneous tissues. So you keep in mind these, these points of weakness and whatnot. Another person who sustained blunt abdominal trauma, guy was hit in the stomach with a bat of some sort and uh, <clears throat> taken to Bellevue and has traumatic pancreatitis. I think we can all see the edema, there's blood around the pancreas, duodenal hematoma, maybe even a duodenal laceration for all I know on this scan. But the patient was treated conservatively. It was not appreciated on this initial scan that there's another substantial abnormality present here. Anybody see that? Well, if you look at the image on the left, there's actually disruption or displacement of the left flank muscles, the transversalis internal and external oblique, from the iliac crest. Right, so this is a traumatic hernia. And again, you just think of these injuries that occur in the brain, these counter -coup lesions. This is exactly what that, this is. It was a blow to the anterior abdomen, and as a result, the pressure foot was uh, allowed these flank muscles which attach to that iliac crest to be blown away. And again, this was not prospectively seen. The patient did not have, uh, or clinically wasn't known to have this hernia. And if you don't detect this, what happens is the guy, you know, leaves the hospital a couple of days later. He's hanging out at a party, and all of a sudden his colon herniates out through the side. It's a very bad thing. So this is a diagnosis that you absolutely need to make. <coughs> Here's the, the same thing. Usually, I would think the clinicians would be able to tell this, but, you know, you can't, you can't trust anybody these days. Regarding the strange things that can happen, I'm going to give a, a discussion on uh, angiography and stents, and, and at least from a, a non-invasive way that we evaluate. It's very interesting stuff, but this is a patient who had a stent graft put in, an ANCURE graft, back in June of 2004. You'll notice usually the proximal aspect of these stents is just below the renal arteries, and this is probably okay. It's a couple of centimeters below. As it turns out, uh, five months later, he came back for follow-up. And this is a complication that sometimes we don't look for. It's not so easy, but I think it's very easy to see if you do a coronal reformat through the area that this stent has done what? It's migrated. Distal migration occurs in about 2 to 3 percent of these stents that are put in, and it's a problem because you will basically lose the seal of the exclusion of the aneurysm sac, and it can allow blood to retract into that. And so when I looked at this, it was an outpatient. I called up the surgeon and said, this guy's graft has migrated. And the guy was complaining of some pain when he had that scan done. He came back in to saw the surgeon, and they examined him. And of course, this is that same patient. And what he has is a gray Turner sign, because you could imagine, based at the time of the CT, I didn't see any leak, but the thing had been migrating out. They took him right to the operating room. And basically, there's all fresh clot in the aneurysm sac. They had to explant this graft, and there's the graft. It, basically, it had moved in the aorta and allowed blood to reperfuse the aneurysm sac, and the guy was leaking blood out of the aneurysm sac. So how can we use all of this data uh, to help us? Well, obviously, understanding the, the anatomy and the normal variance is important, but it can allow us to recognize disease and maybe even triage patients. And so let me show you some examples. This is a... Um, a couple years old, a patient who was stabbed and brought to Bellevue Hospital, stabbed in the left flank. And I think that at the present time, I've noticed some of my uh, residents here who are usually ex very good. Um, I would say that the vast majority of time I would come in to read those cases and the patient will have rectal contrast when there's penetrating trauma. And the reason to do that is to see if contrast is leaking out of the colon because that's really going to force the surgeon to operate. If we look at this case, remember the patient was stabbed in the left flank, and you can see that there's a bubble of gas right here. There's a hematoma in the posterior pararenal space, and obviously there's a contusion or laceration in that left kidney with multiple bubbles of gas around. The question that was posed to us when we looked at this is, is there a colonic injury? Because again, if there's a colonic injury, they're going to take the guy to the operating room. If, in fact, there is no colon injury, one could make the argument to treat this guy with antibiotics. You know, who knows where that knife was? You know, does this need to be debrided or could you safely watch that is, is a different question. But if we look, again, here's the posterior perianal space, uh, fascia, excuse me, the anterior perianal fascia, the lateral conal fascia. All the fluid, all the edema, all the gas, again, here's the anterior perianal fascia, is in the perirenal space. There is no bubbles of gas in the anterior perianal space. On the basis of these images, I said there's no colon injury. 
Well, they wound up taking the patient to the operating room anyway, which is fine because then we get the correlation. There was no colon injury. Um, but, you know, had I given contrast via the colon, I don't know if that would have prevented them or not. But it goes back to the point, like there's no urine leaking out of this thing on delayed images. It's a little bit of a hematoma there. Does the thing need to be debrided? That is the left kidney. But again, using those fascial planes, I think, can be very helpful to you in evaluating disease. And, and this is important. Now, at Bellevue Hospital, I would say that we have maybe two or three penetrating traumas a weekend. Nicole? Not, not, not that much more. I mean, it's not, New York City is a rel relatively safe place these days. <laughs> but uh, my friend Jorge Soto from Colombia, and I don't mean Colombia uptown, but Colombia in Medellin, Colombia, tells me that they have 40 penetrating traumas there every weekend. And their trauma surgeons just can't deal with operating on every single patient that has penetrating trauma. So, you know, they've published a lot of work that, in fact, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, even in the setting of penetrating trauma, do a CT. If it shows that there's no bowel injury or no active extravasation or life-threatening injury, what they'll often do in those patients is observe them over the weekend. You know, if they're doing well on Monday, get another CT scan, if the patient's still okay, they send them home or back to wherever, you know, it is that they're causing their troubles. But <laughs> penetrating trauma, you never know uh, what you're going to get. And, this is a guy who came into, uh, I'm serious, he came into Bellevue, I was reading that day, uh, it was on a weekend, and the history was, fell on a plunger. <laughs> he was brought in via ambulance, but uh, you, know, you can imagine the potential trauma that one of these things could cause. This is not the particular plunger that... Uh... But our resident who was on call that night did a CT and put a little catheter into the rectum. Actually, this is a pretty big catheter. I would recommend to the residents here or to anybody here that if you are going to put a catheter into that rectum and there's a question of rectal trauma, to be careful and use a small catheter. You know, because you don't want to make a hole any bigger. And this looks like a pretty big catheter here. But you'll notice right from the very start that there's contrast adjacent to the rectum outside and also along the extra peritoneal spaces of the pelvis. And in fact, if we track this contrast up, it's all outside of the bowel comes up along the, uh, I don't even know what space this is in. It's some vascular space, but comes around into, but all of a sudden you'll notice that there's contrast in the peritoneal cavity as well. All right, and it continues up, I mean, look at this. And then out into the, into the flank muscles here, you'll notice that there's some rib fractures uh, right here. This is like a, a fracture from the inside out, if you could imagine, like the alien, you know, when that thing popped out of the patient. <laughs> Well, I mean, how, what else could you do in this patient except operate on the person? And um, they, they ran the bowel. There was no bowel injury because what happened was there was a rectal tear. The thing went through the rectum and up that, rect the, that space, that perirenal space on the right, and actually punctured into the peritoneal cavity up near the kidney. They found a hole over there, which they, which they fixed. They wound up doing a diverting colostomy on this guy, I believe, and I don't know what happened to him at this point, but I suspect he'll be a little bit more careful in, in the future. Now, trauma, you know, here's a patient, I don't know, we, we've talked a little bit about pancreatic cysts this, this um, meeting, but not a lot. I mean, pancreatic cysts are becoming really a, a problem because we see them almost every day. If you do MR, you're going to see them. Here's an old lady, 80 years old, not, maybe not that old, uh, in case anybody is in here, but, uh, you know, she has this cyst, and, you know, it looks like such a benign-looking cyst. Right, there's no nodularity, there's no septations. The gastroenterologist decided, well, let me do an endoscopic ultrasound. You know what should be done with this thing? Either nothing, it's a clinically insignificant cyst, or if you have to do something, just follow it with an MR. Well, they did an endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, again, here you can see on the coronal view this strange looking cyst, but it has a very benign look to it. They ran into some problems when they biopsied the lesion at endoscopic ultrasound. I, I don't really know, but the patient wasn't feeling well. We got a CT scan after that. You can see that there's a lot of fluid around the pancreas, and this is just tracking all the way into that, you know, from that duodenum in the anterior perirenal space and tracking all the way down into the pelvis. All right, so you can get post-traumatic pancreatitis, but this doesn't really look like this. And in fact, this is much more consistent with a duodenal perforation. And unfortunately for this person, uh, despite initial attempt at conservative management, she wound up having to have the duodenum. Actually, they were able to close two holes in the duodenum primarily, put a couple of drains in it. But this was an older lady, 80 years old, who ne never had to have any of this done. 
When the surgeon operated on it, by the way, they were very clear-looking cysts. They aspirated the fluid. These were small serous cyst adenoma, a benign lesion. Regarding pancreatitis, this is a bad case, right? This, you know, you have all of this gas in the pancreatic necrosis. And when you see something like this, it's one of two things, right? It's a pancreatic abscess or it's infected necrosis. And really, they're exactly synonymous. I mean, it's usually due to infection in the pancreatic necrosis. Occasionally, this can be the result of fistulization of the pancreatic necrosis with the descending colon. Because remember that these structures are in very close continuity. They're both in the anterior pararenal space. In fact, in this person, you'll notice the descending colon is right here, and this is the pancreatic necrosis with gas in it. To have so much gas in it like this is usually a sign that it's infected necrosis. Of course, if you do fistulize from the colon, it's going to be infected necrosis anyway. I mean, who wants fecal material in that pancreatic necrosis? Well, this obviously should be debrided, and it was debrided, and they did a pretty good job in the debridement. But you'll notice on the follow-up CT scan that there is now positive contrast material in the pancreatic necrosis. This is the descending colon, and what's happened in this person is that there is now a fistula from the descending colon into the necrotic bed, pancreatic necrotic bed. What, so, I mean, basically you have a fistula in this person, and there's a drain in there that's going to drain this out. It becomes a problem. Some of our pancreatic surgeons, when they do a debridement, will automatically do a diverting transverse colostomy or right colostomies to prevent fecal material from being in the, in the descending colon. It's a little bit controversial, but these uh, complications of a fistula from the descending colon to the pancreatic necrosis is not uncommon. It's certainly been reported, and it makes sense if you consider the retroperitoneal spaces. I talked a lot about pancreatitis. It's a very bad thing because it can just eat away from really from the diaphragm all the way down to the pelvis. There's a couple of other things that really can do such destruction. Um, and one of them is what we see here. This is a person, I mean, on a scalp film, there's multiple dilated loops of bowel. The CT shows a target appearance in a loop of small bowel in the left upper abdomen. Has anybody seen anything else on that scout radiograph? Not so easy, but yes, okay, so there's uh, subcutaneous emphysema, or gas. Um, you know, be careful because sometimes, you know, I see, hear the residents call this intraperitoneal free air, and I know that's what we've been taught to call it all the time, but it's really not air. I mean, you don't want to be breathing that stuff in. It's some sort of gas, so just call it gas because it's not really air. But this is tracking all the way down and look onto the spine. And we look at the CT in this person. Now, this is done on a four slice scanner about four years ago, or three years ago. It's a terrible case. A guy has severe Crohn's disease, right? Fistulizing, multiple loops, in fact, coming into the psoas, and there's a psoas abscess. We can follow this psoas abscess into the iliacus, right? And you can see that it comes out through those anatomic points of weakness where the flank muscles insert on the iliac crest, and in fact, comes right down into the gluteal muscles and into the uh, extensor muscles of the hip. A very severe case. Now, you can look at a bunch of axial images. It's been shown over and over again, sometimes having the coronal display showing the inflamed bowel fistulizing into the psoas muscle, into the iliacus muscle, and then, of course, out into those gluteal muscles. Just a very nasty case. This person, unfortunately, ultimately died from severe Crohn's disease, never left the hospital after this uh, CT examination. Other infections can track along those retroperitoneal spaces. These, in, you know, necrotizing fasciitis uh, is a severe uh, process. This guy is a quadriplegic, and he's lying around most of the time, and he develops the cubitus ulcers, but came in because there was crepitus, and you can see all this gas around the malformed, or deformed, I should say, left femur edema, and notice that it's coming along up into the obturator internus muscle via the ischial rectal fossa. You can see there's an abscess here, but look, as we track these axial images up, you have gas in the region of the iliacus, and it crosses over onto the right side. It's kind of unusual for something in that, in that space to cross over to the contralateral side. It goes all the way up to the diaphragm in the posterior pararenal space, tracking on either side of the aorta and cava. If we look at coronal images here, again, you see this really severe process in the right flank up along the aorta and cava all the way up into the diaphragm. And originally it started here, and the initial insult was at this level. Well, this was all drained, and they got it back infected, necrotic uh, blood and, and fat. And the patient actually did fairly well. 
But I was asking myself, why did this process from the right flank get all the way over to, uh, from the left hip, get all the way over to the right flank? And, you know, again, you have your, your data set, and I just was looking at the bones in this guy for a moment, and I noticed that there were these two defects on either of his iliac crests. And I wasn't sure what this was, to be honest with you, and I asked one of my bone colleagues, maybe somebody who lectured to you yesterday, they're pretty good at bone stuff, but uh, they said that this is defects in the iliac uh, crest, they do this to take the psoas muscles, uh, the iliopsoas insertions from the lesser trochanter to the greater trochanter to prevent flexion contractures. And there's no question in my mind that what happened because of this surgical manipulation that allowed this process, which is really in the posterior perirenal space, to track up along and then onto the right side. But there's always some, some explanation, or not always some explanation, but, but often. And, and you look at everything, all that data that's available to you. I want to just finish up in the last few moments on what I consider lesions of the pancreatic or duodenal groove, because this is a retroperitoneal space, and it's actually a really cool space, because a lot of interesting pathology occurs in this area. This is um, just an image from a Whipple procedure, but just to show, you know, some of the things that you got to consider. Obviously, you have duodenum, you have your head of your pancreas, there's lymph nodes that live in this area, there's blood vessels, and obviously, there's everything that could be related to the pancreas and the duodenum. So let's take a look at some cases because it's, always, it's not always so easy. We look at this person who has a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, had some abdominal pain. Here's the normal pancreas. These are early phase images. You'll notice that the normal enhancing pancreas enhances briskly during the pancreatic phase. There is a rather low attenuated infiltrating process in the head of the pancreas that's extending to the duodenum. It's very subtle, but it's there. And the question is, what is this? Is this a duodenal process or a pancreatic process? Well, you kind of look for where the epicenter is. Sometimes it's difficult. Of course, there's no pancreatic or biliary dilatation in this case, which might make you think that maybe this is more of a duodenal process. But if you look very carefully, the epicenter of this, to me, appears to be in the pancreas. And in fact, this patient underwent a Whipple procedure, and this was a pancreatic adenocarcinoma infiltrating into the duodenum. These are just some other images of that same process showing the lesion infiltrating in this area. And here's another person, um, multiple hepatic metastases. And you know, you could, you know, be seeing such large mets like this as coming from the colon. As we scroll through these data, you know, in this case, we're focusing in on the pancreatic or duodenal groove. You know, right here, here's pancreas, here's duodenum. We'll follow that up. There is thickening and infiltration primarily in this case around the duodenum not the pancreas. This turns out to be a duodenal adenocarcinoma with metastasis up to the pancreas, uh, up to the liver. So, you know, look at that. Another person, a young woman from Bellevue, marked biliary and pancreatic duct dilatation. You can follow these ducts dilated, and you always look for the point where there's the obstruction. In this case, there's a large infiltrating intraluminal lesion in the duodenum, and this is a villus adenocarcinoma occurring at the ampulla of vata. A little bit better prognosis than either of those two things that we just saw. Well, what about this case? Honestly, I, I forgot what this case was, but let's take a look uh, as we scroll through it. Uh-huh, now I remember. Well, I hope everybody can see the pathology in the pancreatic or duodenal groove there. As we come up, the normal pancreas is enhancing, and as we come around, uh, and look at the region of the pancreatic duodenal groove. Here's the duodenum, some bubbles of gas in it. There's this large, infiltrating, somewhat hypervascular mass. See that? Now, the question is, what is it? Here it is on the early phase and the late phase. You can see it's hypervascular. You're kind of losing the density of it. If we look at the coronal reformatted image in this patient, again, you see here it is, pancreas coming around. So is it in the pancreas or the, or the duodenum? I think the epicenter of this lesion is in the pancreas, and I think we have a differential diagnosis of an islet cell tumor. It doesn't really look like an adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinomas tend to be not hypervascular, but hypovascular. So you have a hypervascular lesion, you could be thinking of an adenocarcinoma. Could it be a gist tumor? I mean, excuse me, a neuroendocrine tumor. Could it be a gist of the duodenum? It's possible, yet the epicenter of it appears to be more in the pancreas opposed to the duodenum. And again, as I pointed out on the uh, lecture on the small bowel, I always look at all the, the findings. What's missing on this guy? 
the right kidney, and this is a metastasis from a right renal cell carcinoma to the pancreatic or duodenal groove, in fact, to the pancreas. Now, you might say, kidney cancer met met metastatic to the pancreas? Well, in fact, a large series from Mayo Clinic shows that the most common metastasis to the pancreas, at least on imaging studies, is in fact kidney cancer. In my experience, it's more likely lung or melanoma, but I certainly have seen kidney cancer go to the, and kidney cancer is one of those lesions that is hypervascular, they tend to show hypervascular metastasis. Now, here's another patient from just the other day, to be honest with you. Um, here's the pancreas. Let's look at this one. We come down to the pancreatic or duodenal groove. There's this lesion right here. Everybody see that? Let me come back to that. Here's the pancreas. Here's the duodenum. Now, if we look at this lesion, this seems to be more centered in the duodenum as opposed to the pancreas. And again, we can kind of follow that back. Looks like it's more, you know, honestly, I'm not exactly sure where it is, but this is a patient. Anybody see the other finding here? Look at that left kidney. There's a large hypervascular mass hanging off the back of that left kidney. Now, honestly, I don't know if this is a MET or if it's a gastrointestinal stromal tumor because it really looks like a gist uh, in the duodenum. But given the fact that there's a big hypervascular renal cell carcinoma and the enhancement pattern looks very similar, you certainly have to think of a kidney cancer. And it's important because how are you going to manage this patient? Well, I spoke to the clinician about this patient, and he said, you know what? It doesn't matter. If it's a gist, I want it to come out. If it's a met, I want it to come out too because it's the only area that we see a potential metastasis. So uh, this patient is going to be operated. I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly what this is, but that is the differential diagnosis, is either a GIST or metastatic renal cell carcinoma in this case. Another patient who has a rather homogeneous, well-circumscribed mass, here's the duodenum, here's the pancreas. All right, this is not necrotic, doesn't show heterogeneous enhancement. We look at the T2-weighted MR image. Again, it shows not high signal intensity. Again, here's the duodenum, here's the pancreas. What is this? Okay, no, it's not, uh, adrenal is a good thought, but it, it's not the adrenal. You can see the adrenal elsewhere. Somebody said a node. Okay, and it is a node, and you certainly have to think about nodes. In this case, an endoscopic ultrasound was done. No biopsy, I mean, a biopsy was done, but there was no perforation. Uh, but the results of the biopsy came back lymphoma. This is lymphoma, you know, in, in, a, in a big lymph node, but it was a solitary focus, again, after contrast, relatively homogeneous on the early and on the delayed phase images. Another big node, and it's important to differentiate nodal disease from pancreatic pathology. Sometimes they can look very similar. This is a person who has uh, right colon mucinous carcinoma. This is a big metastasis. And remember, right colon cancers frequently metastasize up that right mesentery to lymphadenopathy just in this particular area that is right by the, by the pancreas. Another patient from Bellevue. Let's look at this pancreas. We follow it down. We got this. Could it be a mucinous cystic tumor? Possible. It looks kind of low attenuated, doesn't it? These are the more delayed images. Now, I'm going to tell you that we, this was originally thought to be a mucinous cystic adenocarcinoma in the pancreas in this guy. He was actually a, a young fireman from New York. And after, you know, consideration, they went, they took him to the operating room to do a Whipple. They pulled the pancreas up. They were about to divide it. And then it looked to them like a caseating lymph node from tuberculosis. It was biopsied, came back acid fast bacillus. This is peripancreatic tuberculous adenopathy. And remember that tuberculous lymphadenopathy is caseating, low attenuated, a very classic appearance. If you saw this sitting in the mesentery or the retroperitoneum, you wouldn't hesitate to call this uh, carcinoma. Another patient reformatted image. Just to show you, there's a lesion here in the region of the head of the pancreas. We look at the morphology of this. You know, is it a cystic tumor? Maybe there's a couple little low attenuation dots in it. We look at the axial images. This is a periampulary duodenal diverticulum. And they're important for a number of reasons. Not so much that they cause problems in general, but they can be, make it difficult for the endoscopist to get in, so it's important to tell them if you see one of these. Occasionally, we'll see this. I've seen about four or five cases of duodenal diverticulitis. This is uh, surgically confirmed duodenal diverticulitis, not dissimilar to what I showed you of that jejunal diverticulitis earlier. Again, the duodenum uh, tick is filled with this kind of fecal-like, particulate material. There's gas posterior to the pancreas, and this is uh, confirmed duodenal diverticulitis. This is another thing you got to keep your eye, you know, just think about. When you see a lesion, a cystic lesion in the head of the pancreas, again, thought to be a mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma, 
As it turns out, this guy, person was scheduled for a Whipple, had a CT for some unknown reason a couple days later, which shows that it's filled with gas and fluid. Okay, so this is another large duodenal diverticulum. Well, we've seen them. Uh, here's back in 97. This was thought to be a small IPMT, although there's calcification in it. When I say IPMT, again, intraductal papillary mucinous tumor, it's very rare for IPMNs or IPMTs to show calcification. The patient had an ERCP to try to evaluate for ductal communication. We don't see any. A year later, the patient came back. It shows gas in the thing, and that's when we thought, could this be a periampillary diverticulum? And if we had only done a upper GI series that cost 50 bucks, you would have been able to... Uh, you know, diagnose that little periampillary diverticulum. Finally, the last case of lesions of the pancreatic duodenal groove is what I'm showing you here. Again, you know, this was thought to perhaps be a pancreatic neoplasm, but in fact, this is the uncinate process of the pancreas, this is the duodenum, and this cystic process is not in the pancreas, but is in the wall of the duodenum. If we look at a coronal reformatted image, again, on a four-slice scanner, this is old technology, a patient had chronic pancreatitis. Anybody know what this is known as? This is cystic dystrophy of the wall of the duodenum. The patient actually had an EUS and biopsy this cyst, and they got back a high amylase level. It's a sequela of chronic pancreatitis localized in the groove between the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. And it's something that one of my colleagues, Alec Megabo, who we've heard from extensively today, always talks about groove pancreatitis. And it's a, a specific entity in that most of the inflammation is localized in that groove, and it can lead over time to cystic changes and thickening and obstruction in the duodenum, as we see in this case. So this is cystic dystrophy of the duodenal wall. So in conclusion, I really don't know exactly what to conclude, but ex except to say that, you know, the anatomy can be important because it can show you how disease can track back and forth, realize some of the variants, and I think in the end it can be an aid to you in making your diagnosis. Thank you.